broken together we're in the book of uh, the Song of Solomon which is a very interesting book if you've ever read it it's a little vivid <laughs> oh me Lord help us today we continue in this study on broken together and this is a part of it because we're dealing with marriage we're dealing with family we're dealing with dealing with relationships and I got a statement for you to ponder today to think about and if you define love in your marriage by your feelings, which sometimes people do, you will not be able to maintain that over a lifetime. Your marriage is not based on your feelings because sometimes your feelings will fail you. But when you involve Christ in your marriage, he'll never fail you. And you may go through some times and challenges in life, but God will give you the victory through those, place, those places and times. Now, I just uh, want to give you a uh, disclaimer here, a warning to brace yourself for today's message in this study because uh, we, I'm going to try to soften the, the uh, blow as much as I can here uh, in being choosing the right words. But I want to begin today by simply stating this, and I want you to know that sexual immorality is a violation of God's Word in any capacity. It's a violation of God's Word. And it's true that God aggressively today opposes any kind of sexual relationships outside of marriage. Of course, uh, for those who are in marriage, there's the process that people find themselves in called adultery. For those who are single, they find themselves in a process called fornication. It's all wrong. It's not right. And it's in violation of God's word. However, on the other side, God wants every husband and every wife to have a wonderful, intimate relationship with one another that is a part of the marriage uh, and a part of the relationship that they have. How do you keep the honeymoon going long after the wedding day? <laughs> and I'm not even going to ask you to answer that question um, because I'm sure I could get some very colorful answers on that. So we'll just let you reserve your comments to yourself. But uh, in the Song of Solomon... And I use the word vivid. Uh, Solomon gives us a vivid description of relationship. Uh, and so he talks about um, this bride. He talks about the relationship. And you look in Solomon uh, chapters 1 through 3 is basically the lead up to the wedding day. If you know anything about Jewish weddings, it's totally different than what we have in our tradition of wedding. Uh, in chapter 3, the big day arrives, and they are united, and they become husband and wife. And in chapter 4 is a glimpse of the honeymoon. Well, guess where we are today? In chapter 4, in the glimpse of the honeymoon. And in chapter 5 and beyond, we get to see what it's like after the honeymoon. Well, some folks, the honeymoon was over a long time ago. It seems like when the car came back home and parked in the driveway, the honeymoon ceased at that point. That's not when the honeymoon stops. Uh, as a matter of fact, you should still be on your honeymoon today, even if you've been married a few years. And I know some of you have been married a few years longer than others. But I want to give you four lessons from the honeymoon. That, and I need your help this morning, so don't, don't sit there. There's, there's not a, a, a pink elephant in the room. Uh, just loosen up a little bit. We're going to, all these colorful looking guys and gals that we've got with your clothes on today, but... You can just relax a little bit. We're going to do fine with this. Uh, i got four lessons concerning the honeymoon that can help your marriage relationship now. And you say, well, I've been married quite a while. I don't know what could help mine. Well, stick with me and I'll help you. And maybe I can show you something from God's Word that will be uh, supportive of, of increasing today the love that is in your home. Number one today is you must be attractive for your spouse uh, first, you've got to know one another in marriage, right? Uh, and I hope that you have grown in that relationship of knowing one another. You know, so many times we get married and we think, oh, when we got married, you may have gone with someone. Cynthia and I went together for three years. Of course, a, a large part of that was I was in the military, and so um, I wasn't home much, but she stuck with me, thank God. And, uh, and I appreciate that. But, you know, you, you learn one another as you grow older in your relationship and in your marriage. And some of you that's been married some time, you're probably still learning things about your mate that you didn't know. So there's a, 
a couple things, uh, lessons for you that we have here today. Number one, husbands must be, and you guys, now listen carefully, just don't stop at this next word. Husbands must be vocally encouraging for their wives. A lot of guys are vocal, but they're not vocally encouraging. And the women say it. <laughs> so we're in the book of the... <laughs> well, uh, stick with me here. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. The word of God says, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Now, he is telling her about, oh, how much he just loves her and how impressed he is with her. So he says, Thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Uh, thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Um, thy hair is, listen to this, guys. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Now, I, I know that maybe, ladies, y'all are thinking the other way. You're thinking, well, I call him the old goat. So, I mean, no, wait a minute. Listen, it gets, it gets wilder. It says, thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn which came up from the washing. I read this and was studying this, and I, I had to chuckle. And I thought, Lord, what are we going to do with that on Sunday morning? Amen. <laughs> Whereof every one bears twins, and none is barren among them. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely, and thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy ox. <laughs> thy neck is like the Tower of David. Built it uh, for an armory. How would you like for your husband to say, you got a neck, it looks like an armory. <laughs> so what does that mean? Whereon thy hand a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Thy two breasts are like two young rows or twins, and they feed among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadow flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh, and to the hill of frankincense. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Well, husbands, you could do well to be vocal in encouraging your wife. I'm not sure if you want to use that phraseology and terminology that Solomon used. So the theme in verses 1 through 7 is, is the beauty of Solomon's new bride, the Shulamite woman that he's taken to be his wife or his bride. He is talking about her beauty and... Um, Two times Solomon refers to his bride and his, and his love for her, and he repeated, spoke of her beauty and his intense love for her and how much he cared for her and how important she was to him. Now, this is Solomon speaking of the beauty of his bride before marriage. <laughs> maybe you spoke of the beauty of your bride before marriage, but, well, maybe things changed after you got home. I don't know. Uh, at the end of the book, though, look what he does. He continues to talk about the beauty long after the marriage. And, and I think that is the quality. You can't, you can't really get this. You can't really measure beauty today just by the outward appearance. Beauty is more than just that. So Solomon, was just, was, he just wasn't seeking to flatter his bride. That was what he could... What he said, he genuinely felt. He just didn't say it to make her happy. He said it because he really meant it. So this is important because the number one need uh, today of a woman is security. The number one need of a woman is security. And the number one, number one way she feels security is through a vocal affirmation. Um, it's nice to compliment your wife. Gentlemen, I hope you all do that. Okay? So much for that. Guy, I think you all are sitting on the edge of your seat about as nervous as I am this morning about this subject. Just relax. If you want your wife to be attractive to you, you've got to tell her her hair is like a flock of goats. Her teeth, her teeth are like freshly cut sheep teeth. Her neck is like the Tower of David. Her lips are like jewels. That doesn't sound too bad. Uh, a belly like a heap of wheat. <laughs> and a stature like a palm tree. And so as you're picking your teeth up off of the floor, after you've said this, 
you may need to reconsider how you say this. Actually, you don't need to do that. I would not encourage you to go home and say, honey, your hair looks like a goat. <laughs> and your teeth looks like sheep teeth. You know, yeah. The point is, you maybe don't use the same description, but what you're doing, you're complimenting, you're affirming your love for your bride. Guys, you need to speak in meaningful ways to your wife. She needs to know that you, you're attractive to her. You're attracted to her. So she needs to hear that you feel your affection towards her. And uh, affection is the environment of marriage, isn't it? Really, it is. Uh, affection should be a way of life in your marriage. The fire doesn't need to go out. <laughs> And gentlemen, if you want to receive the kind of affection that, you, that you're looking for, you must learn to give your wife the kind of affection she needs. That's an affirmation of security for her. It's called what? Yeah. Yeah. All this starts, all this starts on how to speak. You've got to learn to speak right. Husbands, you should be vocally encouraging to your wife. And all this, also in this passage of Solomon, we find another teaching. The second point is, wives should be visually enticing to their husband. I'm sorry, ladies, I got a hit on it. Solomon was excited about his wife. And of course, when we read chapter 4, and we look at verses 1 through 7, we struggle with some of the words that Solomon used because... We relate it to things and we think, oh my gosh, why did he say that? Actually, if you'll read this in its true context, the poetry is picturesque. It, 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 the dove, uh, for the dove is a traditional symbol of purity and innocence. And so the, the goats of Syria, when he talked about the goats of Syria, that's what he's talking about, they're mostly black and they have long, silky, wavy hair and really, that's a metaphor that creates a beautiful scene. So really, he is complimenting her. He's not saying, you old goat. Uh, <laughs> he's actually complimenting her beauty. Her teeth are likened to sheep, emphasizing that they're smooth and they're white and they're beautiful. And Solomon describes her mouth as being lovely, a beautiful mouth, a beautiful smile, just a beautiful countenance. The, the simile likening her neck to a tower of David, and we may think, well, what is he talking about? Her neck must be really long. No, it's reference to her, her erect and her, her queenly state of presenting herself, that she looks with a quality about her. She's full of dignity and grace. Maybe those are two good words to use. And Solomon continues in his description of the lady that he loves. So Solomon's wife is attractive to him, and he is vocal about her beauty. Also, ladies, Solomon's wife didn't sit around. Remember now, we're talking a little bit about the ladies. Uh, his wife did not sit around in her Mickey Mouse PJs all day. Not only do you need to not get, sit around with your PJs on all day, your head, your hair does not need to look like a bird's nest. Brushes are made to comb your hair with. Amen. She made herself attractive. And she took care of her appearance. She always tried to look nice. And I think that's a quality. I know for my wife, she always tried to look nice, whether she was in public, whether she was at home, wherever she was at. She always tried to look nice. And my God, I could eat her up. She smelled so good. She really did. As a matter of fact, Drew and Tiff uh, bought me a bottle of her cologne, and sometimes I just spray it in the closet where her clothes are at just to catch that aroma. I'm sorry, but, hey, it helps me, so it's, I just got to do what I got to do. Uh, I believe, ladies, you should do everything to keep yourself vis visually attractive to your husband, and, and I think that's important. I know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but also we have different definitions of what beauty is and what beauty is not. So I'm not telling you to look like someone else. I'm not telling you to look like Melania Trump or anyone else. I'm telling you 
you be who you are, but take care of what God's given you. And, uh, and I think it's good to be yourself and not put on a false image. But I think it's also good that you take care of the quality that God's placed within us. So, no, we're not to, and I'm not encouraging you to buy that Hollywood uh, stereotyping of what beauty is and what beauty is not. It doesn't matter what the world thinks is beautiful. You know, it matters not. The fact is, your love is generated in your heart. And I admire and respect you couples that have been married longer, and I see you holding hands, and I see you hug, and I even see you exchange a peck, a kiss, and compliment each other, and, and treat each other with kindness and love. I like to see couples walking together. And, uh, and I, I think that's important. It shows a unity. Just little things that stand out in a relationship, it shows the quality that you have. And what matters is, what is really attractive between a husband and a wife, you know, it's not what somebody else thinks or says. It's that's your wife, that's your husband, and you're to love them for who they are and what they are. And I look at it this way. There's always room for improvement, right? Amen. So, ladies, you should be the best you can possibly be for your man. And always try to look your best and express your love to your husband. Refer to him as your husband. Refer to him by his name. Don't call him all these other cliches, and gentlemen, don't call your wife all these other names that sometimes men have for their wives. Um, that's disrespectful. I know sometimes we say things in jest, but honestly, you better be careful what you say in public because people can get the wrong impression. I think you need to respect each other, and I, need, I think you need to show that love towards each other. So the first lesson is to be attractive for your spouses, and men, you need to be more vocal and uh, women, you need to be more visual. So that's an important part of it. Now, second thing is be intentional with our planning. We need to be intentional today with our planning. Let me give you a couple bullets pertaining to that. You have to plan and prepare places for intimacy. Listen, I'm not going to get into the depths of that. Solomon referred to, his, to the woman as his bride, and it's a very natural for them to be together as it's very natural Thank God that a man and a woman, uh, that's God's plan. He's never intended for the same sex to be together. He intended for a man uh, to be with a woman and a woman to be with a man in marriage. So Solomon took his Shulamite bride. He took her to a private place, and you need to plan places and times that you're with your spouse. You don't have to go out with everybody all the time. You need to go out and spend time together with each other. Uh, you need time together. You, you need this privacy. You need that intimacy. Uh, and I know for me personally, you know, I have always been so involved with my work. And call it what you may, I am a workaholic. I've always been and I've always probably will be. And there were times that I felt so guilty that I did not spend adequate time with my wife. And I, I've regretted those places and times in my life. However, I can tell you that Cynthia understood who I was and what I did, and she was extremely supportive. But we found ways to make up for those times that I could not be at home and those times that I was not there. And we found times that we could spend quality time together. And, and I had begun trying to take part of an evening or do some things and spend some time with her and spend some good times. And man, I tell you, I got a plethora of good memories uh, and, and I'm sure each of you today have just a, an assortment of great memories in your marriage and your walk with each other and those places and times. You continue that. And, and here's some good points to ponder for you today. One, men, give your wife a special date night. You guys ever take your wife out on a date? Don't raise your hand. Do you ever take her out on a date? Preacher, we don't do that kind of stuff. That's stupid. No, it's not stupid. It actually adds... Uh, relationship to your marriage and intensity and good. That doesn't include the kids going along with you. You need to pawn the kids off and, and this doesn't include kids. It does not include you sit and talk about work. You don't talk about problems and anything that will distract. You simply spend time together and that's it. You don't talk about your finances. You don't talk about your problems. You don't talk about your work. You don't talk about your kids. You don't talk about any of this. You talk about each other. 
in your love for each other. Ladies, you need to plan a night at home sometime. And that means that you've got to pawn the kids off on grandparents or, or relatives or neighbors or something like that and, uh, and take some time and spend some time together with each other. You, you spend quality time together, and that can only involve both of you. And it works. So the first priority for, for a man and a woman in marriage is to be a good husband and to be a good wife. Could that be said of you today in your relationship that you are a good husband or you a good wife? And, and you'll do more uh, for your family by being a good husband and being a good wife than just existing for your children. I've known situations where parents just coexist together and as soon as the kids got grown and went their separate ways, then the parents went their separate ways too. They divorced and got out of the marriage. I'm sorry, you, your marriage is not just for your kids. Your marriage started with just you two, and you need to keep that relationship. At first priority, of course, in any marriage, in any home, in any relationship, is the Lord Jesus Christ, and our second priority is our husband or our wife. So you've got to keep Jesus in your relationship. If you want to stay married after your kids leave home, you've got to intentionally plan times of romance and and dates and intimacy and things like that. I know times that I have sat down with couples that were struggling. And I mean, I don't have any new tricks up my sleeve. I just, first thing I'll ask them, are you spending time together? Are you going out and, and on dates? Are you spending time at home together? Are you eating your meals together? Are you turning off the stupid cell phone and Facebook while you're at the table? I mean, so many times I've seen couples out uh, out to eat, and they're supposed to be there. There's, he's at one side of the table, she's at the other, and both of them got cell phones, and they're Facebooking themselves to death. Why would you even go out? Leave your phone in your purse or your pocket or in your car. I'll cut it off. Spend time together and enjoy your company. You don't need these distractions in your life, right? Amen. Remember this about planning. Planning initiates priority. And so another point for you is we have to learn the value of building anticipation. And in that process of anticipation, Solomon went on to say in chapter 4, 9, and 10, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes and with, a, with one chain of thy neck. Could you imagine your husband coming in the door one night, ladies, and saying, Honey, you just ravished my heart. And you'll say, What's wrong with you? What have you been drinking? <laughs> I mean, you got you to start using some terminology today that shows you love her. You know, man, you're in love with her. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse? How much better is thy love than wine? All the smell of thine ointments that are all spices. I mean, Solomon's saying, you've made my heart beat faster. Does she still make your heart beat faster? Does he still make your heart beat faster? Well, he's not the guy I'm married. I'm not talking about his, uh, her physical appearance. They're still the same person, but they've grown in their love and their relationship with you. Solomon and his wife are, are building a sense of anticipation here that is founded in true love. So husbands, wives, here's a good one for you, and I'm glad I'm not asking you to answer this in public. Do you kiss your spouse in the beginning of the day? You need to start doing it. If you're not doing it, practice it. Try it. First thing you do before you say, you don't mean you'll have a coffee on yet? <laughs> you need to learn to come in and, and compliment her and forget the coffee. Something a whole lot better than coffee to put against your lips is her lips. Right, guys? It's weak. I, I tell you, you should compliment her. And you should compliment her in the company of others. Well, me and the old lady, we are. Uh... What? You need to compliment your wife when you're in the presence of people. You need to express your affections to your wife. And I think the statement is strong. Learn to live with your wife in an understanding way. So, ladies, use the visual means to take initiative. Wear your favorite perfume. If you don't have one, get one. Always try to look your best. 
Learn to talk openly with your husband. Be honest with him. And from Solomon's writings, all the senses of a man and woman can be expense, ex, that can be experienced is included. So you'll find the sense of sight, sound, taste, touch, and the smell are all engaged in that process. I've got to hurry up and finish here. It means that you can hold hands in public. I see Carl and Carol do that sometimes. That's great. It's a great thing. You ever sit in church and hold hands? Nothing wrong with that. Amen. Let me give you the third one. I'm almost through. Be protective of your intimacy. Your intimacy is private today. The physical relationship is to be exclusive today. And so we have to, we have to come to believe that sexual purity is, is no longer a reality in the 21st century, it seems. But sexual purity is still God's standard. And you need to respect that. And it should be a reality today, not an exception to the rule. 1 Corinthians 6 and 18 says, Flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth uh, is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Uh, so God isn't just saying, don't. God is saying, you wait. You don't have uh, sex before marriage. And prioritize your marriage for you and your spouse. Take it serious today. And God is pleased when a husband and a wife today are devoted and satisfied with each other and they seek to put God in their marriage and their relationship. And let me give you the fourth one real quick. Be ready when life interferes. There's a couple points here. There will be circumstantial op obstacles that you will face in your marriage and you, you can read on in chapter 5, verse 2, and you'll find that Solomon's wife is at home alone at night and these can become uh, obstacles if you're not careful. Secondly, circumstances does not always make it easy in intimacy with the husband and wife. So we realize circumstances sometimes we face, but you've got to learn to work through those circumstances. And I know sometimes tired and working long hours, commitments and interest and, and everything else demands all rob the marriage. You need to leave the business at the business and not bring it home in the marriage. You need to work through. You don't need to come in and say, honey, how'd your day go? And boy, she pops a cork on you and unloads on you. That's not the way it should be. Sometimes life gets in the way, but you need to not let it get in the way of your marriage. Thirdly, wounded pride and shattered expectations interrupt and interfere. So misplaced priorities uh, cost in your marriage. You need to prioritize your marriage. You need to prioritize your life together. And pride and expectation can be a disappointment. So you've got to guard against those things. Marriage can become dysfunctional. And all this talk about dysfunctional today in our world and education and everything else. Well, I'll tell you where the real culprit lies is dysfunction within our marriages and in our homes and in our relationships. So, you know, you, you've got to learn today to work at your marriage and to intensify it and to increase it. Has your marriage grown cold? Do y'all just coexist? <laughs> y'all just live under the same roof? I mean, is love lacking in your home? You need to stoke up the embers. You need to refile the relationship. And if it means you need to get away a few days and spend time together, just the two of you, do it. Nothing wrong with it. The only way your love will stay alive is when you stay in love with your spouse. Not somebody else's. In love with your spouse. So I'll close with this today. And you can take a deep breath and say, Learn to cherish your mate as a precious and sacred gift from God. And that's exactly what your mate is. It's a sacred and precious gift from God. And you know what? When you involve God in your home, your marriage, your relationship, your marriage will grow. Your love will intensify. And God will bless it. And the church said, Amen. thank you, Father, for the time that we had today to break into the pages of the book of Solomon, the Song of Solomon, and catch a glimpse of what you desire in our relationship, our marriage. I pray your blessings upon each one in this church today, whether married or single. I pray today that you'll watch over them and, Lord, keep them and bless them. Thank you for Lord, this blessing that we've had today to look into you, your word and glean from it things that will encourage and enhance and even intensify our marriage and our relationships. And we pray that you'll bless this church, its people, 
And as people come into this place today, may the Spirit of the Lord dwell in this place. May hearts and lives be touched. And Lord, may it be an awesome day at Gethsemane Baptist Church. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.